thing that we continue to see in the Gospel of Mark and that he wants us to understand is that Jesus was about that action. He was about the action. He, it was immediately, everything, he was, it was very, very detailed and just up and at him. I gotta go, there's things that need to be accomplished. And so we're seeing that he's about that action. And then we see that uh, Pastor K last week, he spoke about the difference between tradition I mean, uh, relationship and religion. Yeah. So we saw the Pharisees, what they, they were calling out Jesus' disciples, like, oh, man, see, they ain't washed their hands before they uh, ate the food. Yeah. And the, Kempton broke it down. It wasn't because, you know, germs and stuff like that. They thought that really made them holy before God. Yeah. And, and Jesus was calling them out, saying, that's not what my father's about. You're so far from God's heart right now. Mm. It's about what's in your heart that he cares about. And so we see that Jesus is about a relationship. And so it's amazing to be reminded of that as we go into the next passage we're going to be spending our time today on this Mark 8, verses 1 through 21. So um, let me pray real quick, and then we'll read that verse. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for everything that you have spoken to us, God, so far in this series, Lord. Thank you for all that we're learning about you, Lord, showing us, God, that you were on a mission, God, and that everything that you did, everything that you showed us, God, was, was intentional, God, and it was to point us to you. It was to show us a deeper reality about God, that God, when, when we understand it, we walk differently. We, we talk differently. We act differently because, God, we know that you are real and we know that you are worthy of our lives. So I pray that you would be with me today, God, as we go through this passage and, God, as we just ask that your spirit moves, would, would you speak in whatever way that you see fit, in a way that would show us more of yourself, God. That is our prayer. Show us more of yourself. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so buckle up. We got 21 verses we're about to read real quick. So um, y'all can help me if y'all want. But it's going to be up on the screen. So here we go. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, they had nothing to eat. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said seven. <clears throat> and he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they, set the, uh, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few fish, a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said to them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of uh, Dalmuth, uh, Dalm me and my wife practiced this like five times. And I was like, I knew I was just gonna get scared when I say <laughs> Dalmanutha, dang, why? <laughs> Thank you, baby, I appreciate it. Give it up for my wife. I'm dyslexic, I got, I got reading issues, I'm sorry, I struggle. That's funny, I had it in my head before I said, <laughs> That's too funny. The Pharisees came and began to argue with them, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them and got into the boat again and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread and they only and they had only one loaf with them in the in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000? How many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? And that's the word of God. Amen. 
Amen. And so in this passage, I want to talk about two different things that I see in this passage and that I feel like it's, it's very insightful about some things that we learn. And there's two things that I, want to, that, that, I, that I would suggest to us, and it's we learn something about Jesus and then we learn something about people. And that's clearly exposed in this passage that we see. And so I want to start off, what do we learn about Jesus? And this is the most significant part. So, so I want you guys to listen to these three things that I feel like we learn about Jesus in this passage. Number one, we see that Jesus cares. We see that he cares. How do we know that? Verse one through three, it says the crowd gathered around Jesus and they had nothing to eat. And Jesus turns to his disciples and say, Man, I have compassion on them. I have compassion on these 4,000 people who have been following me. And how long have they been following him? He said three days. They have been following him in this desolate place. And Jesus said, I have compassion. And you can imagine in, in a space like that, 4,000 people, and you're in the middle of nowhere, that's a lot of people to account for. I don't know how many leaders would be like, we got to figure something out with these 4,000. When they signed up to come with me in the, in the wilderness, in, in, in this desolate place, they didn't say, oh, we'll be providing lunch, we'll be providing your every need. None, none of that was expected. They were just following him, okay? But Jesus, he felt within himself the responsibility like a shepherd, somebody who is genuinely caring for the people that are following him. So he's thinking and he's considering the well-being of these people that have been following him. And to be honest, a lot of leaders maybe would have let them go. Hey, I, I did my, my job. I, I went ahead and gave them the word and they, they, they got the teaching and then y'all adults, go, go on your way. Y'all figure out something on the way back home, right? You guys are resourceful, you can figure out something but he didn't even want to risk that. He said these people, he even, some people have went, came from far away. He couldn't even imagine the, the possibility of them fainting on the way home. It says in, in, in the NIV, it says they, they might collapse on the way home. You can see his, it's already wrapped up in his conscience, in his mind. He, I can't even bear the thought of them collapsing on the way home when they had been with me three days. You know what I'm saying? Like three days is a long time. Some people could have folded and went back the first day, first couple hours, like, all right, that's enough, Jesus, that's cool. I think we've heard enough. No, they walking with him. They want to be with Jesus. They're trusting him. And he felt the responsibility for the entire group. And it might seem small, but when you step back and think about it, the magnitude of the fact that there's a God that cares so much for us, the, the basic necessities of our daily of our daily needs he cares he really does care and do you believe that this morning that he cares for your needs do you understand that he's thinking about your needs when you don't even know that he's thinking about them yeah. you understand that they, they didn't realize that oh um man i hope jesus is thinking about a meal sometime soon because we out here in the middle of nowhere we're, we're kind of we're stuck we're all stuck mode we're, what are we going to do Jesus is already working a way to, to, to show you who he is. And number one, it starts off, just understand that he cares. Can, can you stop this morning and just let that sink in, that Jesus cares. He cares for you. We are just like the people that were with him, following him in this desolate place for three days. And Jesus stops and tells his disciples, man, I, I have compassion. I care so much. I can't, even, I can't even fathom the thought of them going away without me doing something about it. So that's the, number one, that's the first thing that we see. He cares. We need to be reminded of that. Number two, Jesus provides. Somebody say that. Jesus provides. Jesus provides. We see that clearly in this because when he told his disciples he had compassion, they had a conversation about, okay, how many loaves do we have? They had seven. Then Jesus said, okay, direct the crowd to sit down. I'm going to pray over this food, and then I'm going to have my disciples pass it out. Amen? And we're just going to split the little seven pieces, and everybody's going to have a little, little small little crumb, and they're going to be satisfied. Is that what happened? 
No, he gave thanks and he did a miracle, something that only God can do. If we would have been me, we would have been little small crumbs and we say, that's going to have to get you home, all right? And we're going to do our best, all right? But with Jesus, he is saying, I provide in a way that only God can. I do the miraculous. I take the small crumb and turn it into enough that will, that will be every, it will be enough. And so he took the bread, he took the bread, gave it to uh, the disciples, spread it all out. And it says that it, he provided for them. And so he's not just showing you that he cares. Isn't it different when somebody says, I care, I care about you. But it's different when somebody does something about it. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes we can get in the habit of, hey, I'll pray for you, man. I'm going to pray for you. Make sure I pray for you. And sometimes back in the day, you just, it wasn't really on your heart for real. That person really wasn't occupying mental space that you cared. Like I'm talking about not just praying for you. I'm coming to your house. Like what's up? I need to find a way to provide or find a way to show you that I care. And this is what Jesus is doing in this passage right here. He is saying, I care and I provide. That, that takes it to a whole new height when we talk about a God that doesn't just say, I care, but he's showing himself and saying, I'm about to provide. I'm about to show you that I care by me providing. And he does a miracle that we can't even wrap our heads around this day. I, I still try to think about it. Okay, so the disciples pull up. Okay, Jesus, what are we about to do? You got the seven loaves. Okay, he blesses it. And then what they not looking down at it like, well, how's this turning into enough to feed these 4,000? It's crazy. They it it keep overflowing. How does that happen? It's a miracle. Don't try to make sense of something that's, that, that's miraculous, that's supernatural, that's out of this world, that's godlike. And that is exactly who he is. You know, buckle up if you think that's a big deal. He's about to raise from the dead. You know what I'm saying? Like God is about to raise from the dead. That is miraculous. And so he provides for 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. So he provides. Let that sink in this morning. He provides. There's a lot of things in my life that I'm wondering, does God care? He provides. Well, there's not enough. I don't, it doesn't seem like there's enough resource. God provides. He gives us everything that we need. He is a provider. He is a provider. He is a provider. He is a provider. We got to tell ourselves that every morning, every day. He's a provider. He, he is a provider. He cares. He's a provider. He cares. He's a provider. God, help me believe that. When I'm prone to, to, to forget you are a provider. And he shows us that in this, in this passage. And one thing that I, that I think is just amazing is just, it's almost like a, it's a coincidence, but it's not a coincidence with God. He's in this desolate place with 4,000 people who are following him. I can't, I can't help but think of the, the similarity or the resemblance just of what you see in the Old Testament. You know, when God is taking his people through the wilderness, and he feeds them with the manna. And so they had nothing to eat in the wilderness, but it said manna came down from heaven. And God fed his people. And now I'm thinking about the fact that even in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, it says Jesus is the living manna that came down from heaven. And so God is fe meeting their physical needs, right, by feeding them. But this whole time, listen here, when, he was, when, he, when they were with him, for three days, walking around, he's meeting their spiritual needs. He's feeding them spiritually. Got to get that. That's the biggest part about what's happening here. He fed, he fed them physically, but he was feeding them spiritually. That's why they were still with him. You understand? That's why they were still following him. Because Jesus is somebody that you want to be around. When he talks, he's speaking words from God. Words that are from heaven. That, that, that ring true to deep within our souls that just cause us to want to draw near. So understand that he fed them with bread, some loaves, but he was actually feeding him from himself as the living bread, spiritually. And so number three, Jesus satisfies. That's the best part about it. Jesus satisfies. 
He, he cares, he provides, and then he satisfies. Mark just jumped straight into it. He, he sums it up in verse 8. He just says they ate and were satisfied. That's it. Point blank, period. And some other, some other um, translation says they ate as much as they wanted. I don't know about y'all. We go to buffets, and we just love when it's a buffet. We eat as much as you want until your stomach is full, until you are super content. You go, I can't do anymore. Just got to fall back. Like, he said that there was so much that he provided out of these seven loaves and few fish that everybody tapped out at some point. Some people might have went longer than others. I'm sorry. I think about that stuff. Some people were really feeling it. They had bigger appetite that was going in, but they all right, you the last one? Okay, cool. We're going to collect the bread, and that's it. We were satisfied, everybody. So we have to understand that this is significant. God is not just showing that he satisfies physically. He satisfies spiritually. And there are, there, there are a lot of things that we look to to satisfy us. Like, I don't know about you, but there's things that we will follow for three days in a desolate place. And we're looking for it to satisfy us like, hey, come on, provide for me, TV. Come on, provide for me, relationship. Come on, provide for me, job. Come on, provide for me, phone. Y'all, whatever, food, provide for me. Don't you care about me? Don't you want to satisfy me? God is saying, those things aren't able to supernaturally do anything for you. They, not only could they not satisfy you physically, we can't even get into spiritual because they, they're not alive. None of those things are alive. They don't have life in and of themselves. God is saying, I am the one that created you, that I'm the one that knows how to satisfy you better than anything, better than you know how to satisfy yourself. We got to get that this morning because we will spend a lot of our lives following things that we think will provide for us. But God is trying to get our attention and say, see what I'm doing here in this story? Something small about these 4,000 people being fed off of bread and fish. I want you to understand that this is who I am. This should point you to an everlasting, all-knowing, all-powerful God who knows you and he cares for you. He's with us. He wants you to follow him, and as you follow him, he will provide. And he will satisfy. So say that with me. Jesus satisfies. Jesus satisfies. Jesus satisfies. We have to remember that. And the beautiful thing is, is that when you stick with Jesus, you get to, you get to see that come to fruition. You get to see him satisfy you. And so we learn, so we learn three things about Jesus. He cares, he provides, and he satisfies. So now let's move on to what we see about people. Y'all ready? Here we go. Number one, people, you and me, we suppress the truth. We love to suppress the truth. It's what we do. We are great at it. And here we see in verse 12, the Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and, and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And so it amazes me that the Pharisees, this wasn't their first encounter with Jesus. They weren't just, just maybe wanting to see, is this Jesus real? No, they have ample opportunity to see if Jesus was real and what he does. They have already made a decision. We not believe in him. We, we don't like how he's interrupting with our religious way of going about things, our pride. And so they've already made a decision. They're going to suppress the truth of Jesus, and they didn't even want to know and see a sign from heaven. That's the amazing thing. They did not want to see a sign. That's, how, that's, how, that's why Jesus sighed. He was, <sighs> guys, don't you see? This is just so unbelievable that the God of the universe is right in front of them, and they're saying, show me a sign from heaven. Do y'all understand the, the significance of that? And just the, the irony of it. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, the Son of God, in the flesh, came into this world, came from heaven. You looking at him. 
Show us a sign from heaven. Show us a sign, Jesus, who came from the Father, who's doing all these miracles. Show us. We don't believe you. <sighs> Why does this generation seek a sign? Why? He said, but he really said, y'all not seeking a sign for real, for real. <laughs> y'all suppressing this truth because I'm right here in front of you. But y'all just want to see so much. Like, oh, come on, do something else. Come on, turn this into a car, please. Just do something that's going to make me feel good. But really, the next day, you're going to be like, all right, well, I don't think he really did that. That was some, something else. I need something else. Keep coming. I need another sign, please. And so he's, he's showing us that, no, you don't really want a sign. So no sign is going to be given to you. And what's funny is that in another um, uh, gospel, it says, no sign's going to be given to you other than the sign of Jonah. And I love that because that just gives a little more peek of the inside of like, I see what y'all doing. I see what you, I'm going to give y'all a sign. It's going to be the sign of Jonah. Just like how jo Jonah was in the whale for three days, Jesus, I'm going to be in the, 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 the heart, the belly of the earth for three days, and I'm going to rise up. So, mic drop. That's it. I'm not going to give y'all anything else. If that's not enough for you, I don't know what's enough. Rising from the dead. And, and doing exactly what I said I'm coming to do. That's Jesus. He, he wants us to understand. And these, these Pharisees who are suppressing the truth, we, we can be like them sometimes. Sometimes we suppress the truth. Jesus didn't really do that. I mean, he did that big thing that I was asking for him to show up, and he, he answered that prayer. But, I mean, that was like back then. That was back then. That, was, that really didn't really Show me that he's God for real. I need him to like do that next thing. Then I'm going to believe that he's God. Is that, is that sound familiar? Or is it just me? Okay. We suppress the truth. Show me another sign, Jesus. Just, just, I need one more. Okay. I promise after this one, I'm going to believe you forever. I'm never going to doubt you. I just need that one sign. We have to stop suppressing the truth. Jesus, deep emotion. You understand? He could have went off on him. Man, y'all better get up out of here. I'm about to flip some more tables. I'm about to really go off on you guys. He was. <sighs> it says with deep emotion. He was moved by their unbelief. It's just <laughs> the unbelief, it moved him to respond the way that he did. But he did it out of a desire for them to really see who he was. Number two, people are naturally doubtful. Once again, people, me and you, doubtful. And now let's go to the, to the disciples and what happened right after that. They just saw the, the miracle of the 4,000, right? And so now they're in the boat with Jesus and they're talking to each other. Man, we only brought one loaf of bread. What are we going to do, man? Like, we in trouble. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I feel like I'll be like that, too. Like, that was nice he did, like, a miracle and stuff. Like, that was, like, a one-time shot. That was cool. I don't want to push it. I want to push Jesus. I was just, got one loaf. And Jesus cautioned them. He said, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. So why is it that we instinctively fear and worry about things that we can't control? And it takes us into a, a space in our mind where we can just focus on what we don't have. We just, it's tunnel vision. We forget about everything, all God's faithfulness, and we begin to doubt. You begin to tell yourself, like, no, see, and this is just how it's going to go every time, and we don't have enough food, and what's going to happen? It's like he, they flip right to worry, and there, there wasn't no faith. Isn't that crazy how we're similar to them with, as the disciples? We're similar. Our first instinct is to be like, ooh, I can't wait to show how, see how God's about to show up and do something crazy. They're talking to each other. Hey, we ain't got no bread, man. We ain't got no bread. We on this boat. We about to die. Like immediately, that's their first thought. And a doubt is lack of certainty, lack of conviction. That's crazy that you're with the Son of God and you lack certainty. You're uncertain. It, that's crazy in and of itself. How could you lack certainty when you've seen him do all these things. You know why? It's because that's just within our human nature. It's what we naturally tend to do. 
That's why we need God to reveal himself to us. And that's why we need God to lovingly, graciously begin to expose where our doubts are. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest. Some of the doubts that I have is some things like practically in my life. So, for instance, we do a lot of community cleanups. We do a lot of uh, just try to beautification around the city. But there always is that doubt like, is it really going to happen? Is God really going to do it? Is this even making a difference? You know, you just have those doubts. I even have more trivial doubts. I don't know, like, when I get on an airplane, I'll be doubting that we're going to land. Like, I'm just like, see, God, I didn't know you was going to do me like this. I'm going out like this. I'm just going to die in a plane crash. That's wild. Like, you really don't care. I'm, 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 I'm not even lying. Like, I really feel like that. I'll be in the air like, God, I'm sorry, man. This is crazy that I'm about to go out like this. <laughs> you, you feel the turbulence, you, and I'm just like, wow. <laughs> God, you don't love me like that for real. Like, wow. I kid you not. It, it was real bad at one point. It's, it's starting to get better because I'm, I'm starting to have to, like, grow in my faith. Like, no, nah, this is wrong. <laughs> that, I feel, that I feel, like, so strongly about that God's not going to land this plane. And then, 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 then the other thing is you doubt, you doubt people's intentions. You doubt people's intentions. Oh, that person is really not for me. God's not for me. He not really, he doesn't really care for me like that. Like you want to believe that God cares for me, but then deep down you're like, nah, he really doesn't. I, I don't see it in my life. I'm not seeing it clearly. I, you doubt yourself. I doubt myself. You know, deep down, well, what's my intentions? What do I want to do? Am I able to accomplish this? Am I able to get up in the morning? Simple stuff like that. Doubt yourself. And I think we need to be reminded, even in that doubt, look how Jesus responds. He, he gently, lovingly rebukes us. Hey, watch that. That's what the Pharisees do. That, that's what they own. No, if you see me and you understand who I am, we're going to move in a whole different way. So our job as believers is to, is to by the Spirit, look to Jesus and he's going to help us move in a way that reflects that you understand who you're with. You understand that? Who are you with? Do you have the certainty to know that you're with Jesus? That begins to shift how we think about things. And we got we to gotta start to detach ourselves from those thoughts of doubt. And let God get to the bottom of those things and point us to him. So the last point, people are forgetful. Yeah. Amen. That's me all day. Verse 17 through 21, it says, Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? And having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? Yeah. See, we're not even talking about the 4,000. We're talking about the 5,000. It was a different one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm bringing up the first one with you. You don't remember the five loaves with the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said 12. You know, how you, know, you know when you're getting 12? It's 12, Jesus. <laughs> hey, sorry, we forgot. In the seven for the, four, the, seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full, full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? See how he's just so patient, he's so just, let me walk you through this. You remember how I, the 5,000, the miracle? Said everybody, you remember the 4,000? How many did we have left over? And, he, and, and, and I love how he just so lovingly, but also in such a way that wants to build up the capacity for wisdom in, 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 like within in somebody. It says, have you not eyes and don't see? Like you, you have eyes, but you don't see. How is that possible? You have ears, but you're not hearing. See, he's making something real simple. It's almost like he's being funny. But he's being dead serious because this should be clear. This should be obvious. And the thing is, is we all are in that boat. We struggle with forgetfulness. I've been walking with Christ over 10 years, and it's like there's certain times where I'm prone to doubt. And, and I'll be forgetful that God has provided, that he has shown me his faithfulness my whole entire life. I don't know what Jesus is talking about personally, but I'm talking about even just what Jesus did on the cross and himself, him revealing himself to me. That's enough. 
for me to know that he's faithful. But God is so good, he'll give you personal testimonies, personal things that he's done to show you. Even the fact that I'm here in this community, in, in, in our community that I love so much, this was God's faithfulness. He knew my heart. He knew what I desired to do with my life. And he led me to a beautiful community, you know, with beautiful people that, that I get to serve and do life alongside of and have a beautiful and awesome church community that I get to have fellowship with. Like, that's God's faithfulness. When I graduated college, I didn't know I was going to be out here. Had no idea. I just knew I wanted to serve and love the Lord. And the fact that he brought me to this place. First, let me go back. God's faithfulness. I would say the biggest thing that God has shown me in his faithfulness is my wife. That's it, point blank, period. Like, when I first became a believer, it's crazy because I feel like God showed me that she was going to be my wife. I just felt like she was going to be. Like, I felt like it was already written, like in stone. Like, she's going to be my wife. She's going to be the one that I go through life with. But during that time, there was, there was a process of, like, trusting God. Like, you're talking about doubt and forgiveness. Like, you ain't really for me, God. You ain't going to give me her. Like, you, you, really, you really about to, like, pull one on me. <laughs> but he actually brought our stories together. And we're married nine years, doing this thing together, walking with the Lord. And it's just like, that's God's faithfulness. Like, for me to doubt him is crazy. He would be looking like, Zach, do you have ears and not hear? You remember what I did with your wife, right? You know what I'm saying? She was bad, and you thought I wasn't going to get her with you. You know what I'm saying? Do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand, Zachary? And, 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 And I'm just like, you're right. I'm sorry, man. You're right. You're right. And that's what we do. That God will lovingly, do you not understand yet? I want my children to understand that I am who I said I am. And I just want to wrap up by saying this. Those things are all true about us, but I think the way that we fight those things is we remember who Jesus said he is. He cares, he provides, and he satisfies. And when Jesus comes to you and you come to Jesus, he lives inside of you. And so now you don't have to go out and find out that he cares, that he provides, he satisfies. He's in you right now. And he provides, he satisfies, and he cares. So look to him this morning, beloved. We got to look to him and be filled up with everything that he said he is and allow his word to speak to us. Do you not yet understand? I care, I provide, and I satisfy. 